frame on the wall looks in the dark, feels the eyes, the cow-eyed girl in the dark, in the dark, doesn't see, can't see, it's dark, save for the fire, dying flame. Thinks, thinks, thinks to speak. Counters, thinking not to speak. Pauses, thinks again. Aborts, stares into the picture, into the dark. Thinks once more, begins to counter. Thinks of aborting, then aborts the aborting. Ooh, it was a sigh. Pale sigh resigns himself to speech, but what he wonders, what is there to say? Quickly, quickly he turns at the feeling of the eyes behind his back. He turns and stares into the darkness beyond the dying fire in the heart. Looks behind, past the faint light, past the dying shadows of the other Benton burgundy chair, past the frame and into the dark of the hall. He stares face tight and contracted at the presence in the hall. The insubstantial man who perhaps is not there, but the bed it feels. And after a good three minutes of piercing quiet without any movement of the eyes, he slowly lifts the left foot high, snug and slipper, and lets it fall before him to the floorboards. Before the rug, he clutches his robe and purses his lips, staring, staring at the man he cannot see in the hall. And he whistles, Bennett whistles low and dull and stops and purses his lips tighter and clutches his purple robe and stares. And then a sound, a sound of a whistle, shrill and sharp, though no one can be seen by Bennett. Yet he knows that that is there, that, that is what he called it. That, or sometimes that thing, but mostly just that, and that is there. He can feel it steering from the dark of the hall. He can feel it now, his unglazed eyes can feel that, with eyes harsher than the photo in the frame. Suddenly, then it jogs to the curtain, curtains drawn over picture window, cocks head right, scratch, scratch on the window's pane, scratch, scratch like an elk or a branch, or an elm, or a branch. Scratch, scratch, like a claw, or a hook. Then it stops. Two scratches, then a pause. Two more, scratch, scratch, then a pause. He pauses, then it stands still. Right ear cocked, waiting for the next scratch. But it doesn't come. His fearful anticipation that would come until in the hall, from the hall, he hears a cough, his eyes twist in his head to the chamber door, the dark of the hall, and the lipless mouth loosens, thinly tightens and pursing at the sound that that has made the first sound that that has ever made. The grip on Bennett's rope tightening, twisting, turning harder and harder. He shifts his weight from the left foot to the right and then furrows his brow and he opens his mouth. You, what do you want? And the last, Gap, the fire sighs, its last light, it's quenched. The white smoke twirls up out of the embers, cold and dark. And Ben is alone in the dark, drowned in the silent response to his words. He stares in the dark at the hall. And that costs again. What do you want? What is it, man? The short whiskers on his chin 
bristle in his goose flesh, but nothing, not a sound. And he, after another good, horrendous stare, whirls to the window's direction on the worn balls of his feet as the scratching, which is now fast and thumping, echoes in his ears. Then it gasps and tightens the grip of his robe, extending his arms slowly out from his waist. Then contracts when he feels flush against his hand. The stealth of something moving past, something he cannot see, and the thing at the window scratching and thumping loud. He releases his robe and clutches his forearm and and shrieks into the dark. That thing bustles about him and shrieks out. For the love of Christ, who are you? And still in calm, Bennett stands rocking to and fro, still clutching his robe, clutching his arms, Eyes tight, lips pursed, and he waits for a noise, but none comes. Then it slowly opens his eyes, now slightly adjusted to the dark, and he scans to the best of his ability. He's to save what is supposed to be there. Save once again for the clumps of shadows, forms unknown, non-moving, but ominous, hulking there behind the sofa, there behind the Benton, there on top of the secretary. Then it stares and winces at the shadows, the fear ungrounded in his bowels, and he thinks and finds a state of clear, and slowly unfastens his right hand from his left arm and lowers it across his front drops it to his side and grunts, grits his teeth and slightly raises it, raises the hand up into the right row pocket, loosens fist, searches, shakes and twirls the contents of right row pocket. And then, not finding what he wants, digs deeper and fumbles again. Then tight eyes, Open, sparkles, tears, an odd smile of blissful relief. The right hand rises from the right pocket, and in its grip, a small box of matches. He raises the right hand up. He raises the matches up to his ear and shakes it. Ten to twelve matches intact. Left hand relaxes from right arm and moves to midriff, where it meets the lowering right hand with the matches. The left pulls open the box and draws from it a match, of course, and, and then closes the box. Bennett's eyes lower to draw a match as his left hand draws match to strip and quickly strikes it, following, of course, a sputtering of flame. Smoke billowing up before Bennett can raise a match to see the shadow's face. A tight grip. A hand presses down on his shoulder. <laughs> A tight grip presses down on his shoulder from behind. And he screeches and quickly turns, raising up the match. But there is nothing there. There's nothing there but the wall and the photo of the cow-eyed girl. Cow-eyed girl in the frame on the wall. His eyes locked with hers, mouth slack at the reunion of the girl that he allowed to leave. So long ago, the left hand moves matches closer to her face, to 
to the Allies. Then, the voice that comes when it's night, and he's alone, and he was always alone, and it is night. And it was always night for him, for Bennett. He thinks of how it was always night for him after. Once after school was done and alone at last in the room, gray and dismal, mattress, window, three small shelves lined with sappho, Gorky, and done. Papers on the floor. Sucked nibs and butts everywhere. A small low table. Empty bottles of absinthe. Her no and seltzer. And this was his home for years. He wrote he was above his uncle's haberdashery. And so the rent the rent was five dollars a week whenever he had it to give. And then was to him the only time there was. As a child. Murray. As a child. Murray. As a child, as a child, Bennett, as a child, he had longed for the dark, for the night to play in, the wax guttering from his large candle onto the books in the large brown chair. Pictures in the dark of changelings and Nosferatu's. His friends. He'd stick the candle in the magic lantern and blow. And witches would dance on brooms around the walls of the room and his eyes would widen. And while the lantern turned, he'd crawl back into the chair. The purple quilts tied tightly around him. His book of mysteries held tightly to him. And the look, and the look of the moving light, the witch, or the ghosts, which he sometimes turned. He'd watch them move around and around. The rains would come, and the candle would flicker, and the suck of the wind in the door. And then he knew. And then he knew. Alone in the dark. The night was his. He belonged to it. Murray. And it was to him. And yet he knew not then of its importance, of what it in itself was. It 
It was only later. Later in the gray, dismal room 